Well, Merry Christmas, brothers and sisters. I think God arranged the weather today so that we would all have to come out of the wet and the cold and come into this place where it's warm and cozy. And we get to enjoy his love and sing together and the warm fellowship that we have here. Let me just dispel that whole doctor thing. I am, it's not legal for me to dispense any medicine in any way. And so I don't, my my name is Don and my middle initial is T and my last name is Dent. My parents named me Don't Dent. That just doesn't even seem right. But you should be able to remember that. You just call me Don't, okay? What a privilege it is to be with you today. We are continuing this series about prophecies related to the coming of our Savior. And today we're looking at the prophecy that John the Baptist was going to come and prepare the way. Now, this is really appropriate because in the gospel accounts about the coming of Jesus, the coming of John is just intertwined all the way through the gospel accounts, and it's really important that Jesus had someone coming to prepare the way. I was witnessing to a Muslim friend a number of years ago, we were walking through the the messengers that God had sent to the, to the world. And we got to John, talked about him a little bit, and, and my friend said, well, that's so interesting that God sent a preparer for Jesus. Jesus is the only person that came to the earth with the message that had his own you know, front band coming in to prepare the way for him. And then he said, that sort of points out that Jesus is sort of special, isn't he? And I said, yes, it does. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what we're looking at today. So turn with me to Matthew's account in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and briefly look at what Matthew describes as the role and the message of John. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, remember that, and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's at hand. It's almost here. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, when John shows up, word spread everywhere. The people of Israel had been waiting on another prophet for 400 years. They'd been waiting on a word from God for 400 years. It had been silent. No special prophet coming. And so now word gets out that there's prophet, but this one is strange. He didn't come to the city, he didn't go to the temple. He's not where all the people are. He's out in the wilderness. And he acts like a survivalist or something. He's wearing, you know, like camel. Camel, not a fancy coat, but camel skin, literally. He's going to the local grocery store out there and eating bugs. What kind of prophet comes from God like that? And and all this did was just stir up interest and curiosity. Who is this guy? He's out there in the middle of nowhere. He didn't come to us. We've actually got to walk out there to him. And then when they got there, He was preaching a surprising message. The Jews were coming and he was saying to them, repent. You are far from God. You have sin in your life. You must repent. You must turn from your old way. These are the Jews, God's people. And then he said a really shocking thing. He said, be baptized. Well, that was a shock because the Jews weren't normally baptized. That was usually what Gentiles did if they wanted to become a Jew. They had to repent of their old way of life and then be baptized. A baptism of repentance, as it's described in John the Baptist. 
And here is John telling God's people who are supposed to know him and be his people that they've got to turn from their sinful ways. And maybe he's saying, your tradition and your old way of life is not adequate. You've got to turn and be ready because something special is about to happen. Now let's turn to Isaiah 40 because that's actually where Matthew is quoting when he talks about John coming to prepare the way. And actually we see this in in both of the Christmas accounts talking about this is who John was. I think John recognized it. I think he acted upon this. And all the people recognize that there's a connection between this passage in Isaiah 40, especially 1 through 5, and this ministry of John the Baptist. So let's read it from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of servitude, her time of suffering, is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one crying out. Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Ah. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain will be lowered and leveled. Uneven ground will become smooth and rough places a plain. We must prepare for what God is going to do and the glory of the Lord will appear in all humanity. We'll see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, let me put this a little bit into context here. It was not unusual in ancient days that when, let's say, a great king was coming through a particular area, actually runners would go ahead to any little towns or villages where he was going, and they would, they would tell the people, The great king is coming, or let's say some conquering general that's just conquered that area and he's making his rounds with his army to come through. They sent warnings ahead because, listen, you didn't want to look like you weren't welcoming one of those guys if they were coming to your town. And so what did the people do? Well, they cleaned up the streets. They probably fixed the potholes. Did they have potholes back then? Yeah, I think they had potholes back then. They whitewashed some of the stones along the road so that it looked pretty. Not just in the city, but outside. The way that they expected this great, powerful person to come. They're preparing the way. And by doing so, they're showing their honor and respect to this human king or general or whoever it was that was coming. This is what John is saying to the people. And this is what Isaiah had prophesied. 700 years before John came. 700 years. And they hadn't had a prophet in all of that time. Let's put this in the context, though, because this passage is is so filled, but but we really need to see the passage in the very unique place that it has in this whole book of Isaiah which happens to be one of my favorite Old Testament books because it's just so filled with wonderful things. But the first 39 chapters up until these verses is sometimes referred to as the book of doom. Now, yes, in this series, you're going to learn about some of the great prophecies about the coming of Christ. There are these brief glimpses about salvation, even in these first 39 chapters. But the overall attitude, the overall message of those 39 chapters is mankind has sinned against God. They've been rebellious. They've been obstinate in their unbelief. They've turned to other gods. And God's judgment is going to fall on all of these people because they are sinners and have rejected the love of this God. 
I mean, there, it's amazing if you read through, we're not going to read all 39 chapters, but if you did read through that this morning and you get up to this point where you see how different this first sentence is, comfort, comfort, my people says you're God because up until now, all these verses have been about doom, gloom, punishment. In fact, God gives specific prophecies about the punishment that was coming to Jerusalem, to Israel, and to Judah. These are God's people. And yet they themselves are guilty before God and his judgment is going to hit them hard. My friends, even though we have the love of God and we know his patience and his grace for us, we should never treat him lightly and forget that this is a holy, powerful, righteous God and he will punish disobedience even in our nation. But then we get to this passage. All the nations are being warned that judgment is coming because your unbelief, you should turn to the Lord. And here we have not just a general, not just a king who's coming. This is crying out that we should make this way straight and re- ready for God himself. That's a shock. That's a shock when they read this. God is reaching out. You see, in spite of all of this time of punishment and hardship and suffering on the parts of the people, there's been this other thing God's been working all along, and that is a salvation that is unbelievable and wonderful. And that's what this verse begins a whole new way of looking at things. And so, actually, a lot of biblical scholars refer to chapters 40 through 66 as the book of comfort. From darkness and pain to light and hope. And John the Baptist is the one who announces that incredible change from this to that. Now, I want to just walk through with you just briefly these next few verses because if we look at, some of you are quite serious Bible scholars and you probably have multiple favorite passages and they're probably not in the first 39 chapters, they're probably in these next few chapters. Because beginning with chapter 40 through the rest of the book, we have some of the most amazing descriptions, some of the most detailed explanations of what Jesus was going to come and do. And we understand Jesus, a lot of it from these passages right here, this book of comfort and hope. So just walk with me. If you've got your Bible, you can open up. I know if it's on your phone, you can flip through really quickly. But I just want to hit a few of them to show you the kinds of things because the salvation that is being promised here is completely surprising. Unlike anything that the people could have imagined before this. Look in chapter 40, verses 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, Yahweh, the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth? He never grows faint or weary. There's no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the weary and strengthens the powerless. Now, I really like this next one because it talks about even youth and young men can get tired. It's been a while since I had that problem. Youths may faint and grow weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This relationship that is coming with, from God is one in which he walks with those who believe in him and he provides them comfort and strength as they carry on their lives and following him. What an incredible promise. Look at chapter 42, verses 6 and 7. The Lord's talking about this Savior who is described over and over in these chapters. I, the Lord, have called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. 
I will keep you and I make you a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. This Savior who's coming is going to set the people free, and it includes all the nations of the world. Incredible. How about Isaiah 45, beginning halfway down through verse 21? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is no one except me, God declares. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn truth has gone out from my mouth, a word that will not be revoked. Listen, every knee will bow. And every tongue will swear allegiance. Sound familiar? Paul? It will be said to me, only in the Lord is righteousness and strength. Here is the God of the universe. He declares it. I am the one and only God, he says. And then he declares to the nations, to the whole earth, Turn to me and be saved. He's offering this salvation that's coming. He's offering this Savior that's coming to the world, to the whole world. This is rather astonishing. Then look in chapter 49, verses 5 and 6. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. Yes, Jesus came to preach and to draw the people of Israel back to God without question. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. But this God says, listen, it's not enough for you to be my servant raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. God is declaring it over and over that his love, which has been for Israel and Judah, for for instance, certainly is still there, but his love reaches to every one of us. And praise his name that there were faithful witnesses between Jesus and me. Because as old as I am, Anthony, I wasn't actually there. (laughs) Some of my students ask me questions like that. What are you going to do in heaven? I've got lots of ideas. I'm going to learn to sing praises in Korean and join that men's choir. That's going to be amazing when we get to heaven. I'm, I'm going to go and find my dad who most influenced me to come to Christ. I saw him walk it. I saw him tell it, and I was so impacted. But I'm not sure who led him to the Lord. So I'm going to go ask my dad and say, Dad, who told you? Who influenced you? And then I'm going to go find that guy and shake his hand and thank him. And I'm going to ask him. And I'm just going to keep following that until somebody's going to say something like, well, you know, there was this guy named Peter or Paul, and then I'm going to go ask them and they say, well, there was this Jesus. Wouldn't that be a glorious thing? Hey, look, we got like billions and trillions of years, so there's plenty of time. (laughs) But how many, think about it. What if one person and that long line of people, maybe 100, maybe 200 people, what if one person had been unfaithful and had not declared the truth to the next person? It might not have come to you. It might not have come to me. Praise God for those faithful people. And that's why today we sit here today, and I can't even imagine how many nations we represent. Praise God, his vision, that the Savior would bring salvation to all the nations is so true as we sit here today. 
Oh, praise his name. And then let's jump to Isaiah 53. Oh, my goodness. More clearly than we ever see anywhere else, perhaps, in the Old Testament, this Savior who's coming, this comfort that's coming to the world, this salvation that extends to the whole earth is based on the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of my transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep, running from God. We had all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. You see, this was going to be a costly salvation. Jesus died for us. And the world, as it says, the whole world. You see, these chapters here in this short portion of Isaiah... My friends, they're just absolutely chock full with these insights that now we understand because we're in Christ and we read the word. But when these prophecies came, they, were, they must have been a shock to the people that were reading it and trying to understand it because there had never been anything like this before, right? Nothing quite like this Let me share with you a little bit about this salvation that John declared was for all flesh, is how he said it. But we're repeatedly told in Isaiah that this is for all the nations. My friends, there are people, I meet people here in America who just wonder what God's up to. Where's God? I don't feel him right now or whatever. The, the church seems to be, so much of the church in America seems to be slowly dying, not doing well. Well, I want to tell you what God is doing among the nations today in our generation that is unprecedented in history. A generation ago, and I'm old enough now to have been there, a generation ago, we were praying that the church in China would survive. I went to a prayer meeting for Two days, and that's all we did. We just prayed that the church in China would survive. It had been perhaps a million or more strong around 1940, and then with the war and communism, most of the pastors in prison, many of them had died there. The church had dwindled down to maybe half a million. We couldn't count them. You know, the, everything was shut down. But it appeared that the church was in serious trouble in China, half a million believers. Today, there are at least 80 million born-again believers in China. That means for every one person a generation ago, there are now 160. Think about that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I love mission history. I read it all the time. Never in the history of the world in one generation... Among one people group, have so many people turned to Christ and been transformed in the history of Christianity. And that didn't take place in the first century. That has taken place in my lifetime. God is at work. He is accomplishing this purpose that is declared all the way through these chapters in Isaiah. For so long, it was slow progress of getting the gospel into sub-Saharan Africa. Westerners, especially Europeans and Americans, went, but the average life expectancy when they arrived in West Africa because of the diseases was less than six months. The missionaries packed their belongings in wooden boxes the size of caskets because they knew they would probably need it in a very short time. But they went anyway. 
At that time, it was just unthinkable of what's happened in our generation. But in our generation, friends, sub-Saharan Africa, the majority of the population is now Christian for the first time in history. Global sociologists talk about the shift of Christianity. What they're talking about is that the center of Christianity is moving south, and Africa is largely Christian for the first time in history. God's accomplishing his purpose for the nations. I took a class in seminary many years ago on missions to Muslims, and we studied great heroes of those missionaries who went, and many of them served 20, 30, even 40 years, and out of that time, they could call on six believers or 10 or maybe 12, but the the work was so slow. You're not going to hear this in the news, but I, I declare to you this is absolutely true. More Muslims have turned to faith in Jesus Christ and been baptized since the year 2000 than in the previous 1,200 years combined. Movements to Christ, where there are thousands of believers and hundreds of churches, have sprouted up in Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Every sector of the Muslim world has seen this kind of response that, quite honestly, a generation ago, we just sort of doubted that was even possible. And by man, it was. But you see, God has a purpose. He's carrying it out. God is not asleep. He is active and powerful. There is nothing wrong with the gospel. I hear people who just seem to have lost all confidence in the gospel to transform lives. And I just say, oh my goodness, I wish you could have met some of the people I've met because the gospel is powerful. And for the rest of the world who hasn't gotten used to hearing it, it is both news and it is good. And they cannot believe that this message could possibly be true. Wow. I want to tell you one story that illustrates. It's just a few insignificant people, not famous. Let's see those, that photo. Can we see it? I was in India And actually, the reason I was there was because the church is growing so fast in this particular part of India that we Westerners have a hard time believing that that could actually be true. In this one section of India, probably 20 to 30,000 new churches have been started in a decade. So I had met Jitunder there on the left, He has a brother, and then this is their mother, Kamla, there on the right. Just poor village people in India, not famous in their village. But when they told me their story, I was so blown away, I had to take a picture. Because they are probably my greatest heroes. You see, just three years before I met them and heard their story... They were home one night in their simple village house, the, the grandmother and the two sons with all of their family, and so three generations there in a simple house, and they were just um, enjoying the evening together, and a knock came on the door, and they opened it, and there was an old friend, and he came in, and he sat down, and he began to describe to them this amazing thing that had happened to him. You see, just a few days before... Someone had come to his house and said, I have to tell you the most amazing thing. I've learned that there is a God who created everything and he is powerful. And surprisingly, he is loving and he knows us and he created us and we were all created equal and he cares about us, but he is also holy and righteous And we've sinned against him, and so we're separated from him by our sin. But by his love, he would not let our sin be the status quo, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, 
to live a perfect life, die on the cross to take my sin and guilt and punishment, and then he rose again to offer us life forever. And this God is asking us to come and believe in him and follow him. And this friend said, at first I just couldn't even imagine how that could be true. You see, these people have been told their whole lives that they were made basically out of their own mistakes from the past and all they can do in life is suffer their own fate and they don't really even have any hope that their own suffering can somehow fix the problem. In fact, they've been doing this for 3,000 years without any hope. And that man said, I just couldn't believe. How could this be true? And he said, but you know, there was like a fire burning in my heart when I heard that story. And so I decided to follow Jesus and to be baptized. And I came tonight to tell you that I'm a follower of Jesus and I want you to know about this God. And then he left and walked a couple of miles over to the village where he lived. Well, the next morning... Before the sun came up, before he could go off to work, there was a knock at his door. That's sort of unusual. People don't knock on the door late at night or early in the morning. So he, he went and he opened the door and there was Jitunder, his brother, and their mother, Kamla. And here's what they said. We came to ask you one more time about this message that you told us last night. The whole family stayed up all night. We couldn't sleep. We just stayed up and talked about how could this be possible? How could it possibly be true that there would be a God so powerful but loving and that he wants to have a relationship with us and he wipes away our mistakes and makes us right with him and now we have joy and peace and comfort forever. They said, Tell us again, is that really true? He said, yes. And then they said, can we get a copy of that book? We want to read that book. We can't wait to read that book. And can we be baptized? Now, in their environment, it's against the law to become a Christian and be baptized. It's against the law. But these people have heard a message that is a revolution, and they don't care. They don't care. And so their friend said, well, absolutely, and they were baptized within a few days and got that book and took it back home. Now, here's what uh, the missionaries and local leaders are doing there in discipleship. Get a Bible, start reading it every day. And these people are hungry because they're coming out of darkness. They want to understand this salvation. They are so hungry. And they not meet just on Sunday morning, though they do. They'll meet probably just about every night and sit and read that book and then talk about it because it's so wonderful. And then the very first day they're a believer, they're given a piece of paper and a pencil. And they're told, as a believer now, make a list of your 20 closest relationships. Family, neighbors, friends, whoever, your very closest relationships, and they do. Okay, let's stay right here, right now. Let's pray for them to also come to follow Jesus. And now, in your first two months of following Jesus, you're going to go and tell them the good news about Jesus to every single one of these people. Well, Jitunder, his mother and the brother, started doing that immediately. And in their first two years of following Jesus, they had started six churches. This is not church that comes out of a lot of money and great organization. This is church that comes out of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. 
Because when people hear this message, they some of them, not all of them, but some of them believe, and they immediately sense the, the Spirit drawing them into deeper understanding and growth in following Jesus and the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit to declare Jesus even when it's dangerous. So six churches in the first two years. And by the way, I, I think I told you, this is an area where Tens of thousands of new churches have come. And it's all from simple people like this. So they were gathering in their home on a Sunday morning. They've been doing this for a while. And actually, again, five other groups like this in the surrounding area around them. But there they are, still growing and still seeking the Lord, meeting in their home, sitting on the floor. And on this particular Sunday morning, the front door of their home burst open, and there stood this large, intimidating policeman, and he's holding a stick. Now, in their language, this kind of stick, it's actually a little bit longer than this, but I couldn't quite get it in my car. So this is a little bit shorter, probably as tall as I am. And you've seen probably in old movies or in the newsreels or whatever, policemen in this part of the world holding that stick to hold back the crowd because I'm telling you, there's so many millions of people, there's always a crowd control problem. So they use it like this a lot. But that's not how the policeman was holding it when he walked in. Because the other thing you can do with this stick, you can whack heads with it. You can kill people with it. You can make everyone afraid of you. And whenever people see a policeman holding this, they start backing up because he's probably going to swing. He walked in there and he sees them sitting in a circle together there worshiping the Lord. And he takes that stick and he points it at each one of them and he says, This must stop. This must stop. Your village elders and the priests in our temple have declared that there cannot be Christians in this village. So all of you must give this up. This kind of thing must stop. And he went and he pointed that stick at every one of them. And then, if you could go back to that picture, Grandmother Kamla, I'm pretty confident she doesn't weigh 80 pounds. Tiny little lady. Without a word, she just stood up and walked right up to, she told me this, I walked right up to that policeman. You don't walk up to a policeman holding a latte. He's going to hit you with it. She walked right up to him, and you would not believe what she said to him. Kill me first. Kill me first. And then she explained it to him. If this must stop, we will never give up following Jesus, our Savior. He has transformed our families. He's transformed our lives. We have found God and we have found hope and peace. And so if this must stop, the only way it will stop is if you kill every one of us and kill me first. He looked around the room and everybody sat on the floor was nodding their head like, yeah, she's first. We're ready. <laughs> I guarantee you he'd never had that experience before because he stood there stunned for a second. And then he just sort of said, well, never mind. And he walked out the door. Two weeks later, while they were there on Sunday morning, everybody in the village knows what they're doing in there. They're singing and reading scripture together. A crowd of several hundred people pressed down through the little gangways, coming down to their little village house, and they've been stirred up. This is a riot, essentially. They've been stirred up by their religious and political leaders to go down there and make this stop. This must stop. 
And when they got just up to the door, out stepped the big imposing policeman with his lati. And he says, you will not get in. And they looked at him and they turned around and went home. My friends, this is the Christianity that is spreading like wildfire in some of the darkest places on earth today. Because God's purpose is that every nation, tribe, and tongue will have a chance to hear and believe. And when these people coming out of darkness hear this good news that we almost take for granted, they're blown away. And they trust him with boldness and courage and simplicity. That is astonishing. Because God's purpose is being accomplished in his power. Praise his name. The gospel got to me and you. But one thing about American Christians is that sometimes we forget that when it got to me, it was supposed to be going to somebody else. It wasn't supposed to just be, oh, Lord, thank you for your love and your salvation, and I'm just going to hold on to it and not say a word about it. And even though over half the people in the world today are in unreached people groups that have no opportunity in their lifetimes to hear the gospel unless somebody from outside comes and tells them, they're still waiting for their chance. So I want to suggest a couple of applications for each of us. First of all, John did say we should be preparing the way for the Lord. And I think, honestly, don't you think, with all of the mess in our world today, with all of the activity, a lot of which is really not focused on Jesus but on all this other stuff, we have two weeks till Christmas Day. We should be preparing our hearts to worship Jesus with all of our hearts and souls and minds. Shouldn't we? Spend time in his word. Reflect on this amazing salvation that we have. Secondly, we're surrounded by a lot of people. And from my experience, not just a couple of miles from here of interviewing and sharing the gospel with hundreds of people, my estimate is that 80% of our neighbors don't know the gospel. They have no idea what Christians actually believe and teach. You can even ask them, and they're, they're going to tell you something. That is not the gospel. They don't know. And we're right here. We should be, make your list of 20 people. We should be talking about Jesus all the time, but certainly at Christmas. We have this incredible message at Christmas, and these so many people around us are looking for some kind of joy without the Savior. It's not going to satisfy. This time of year, I encourage you, we've seen God's purpose all through Isaiah was that all the nations would hear. And praise God, we from many of those nations have heard. Isn't it appropriate at this time when we thank God for a Savior for the whole world that we would pray for the nations that have never had a chance to hear? 2,000 years, they're still waiting. And what about the missionaries that are out there scattered around the world? Your church supports missionaries and the largest mission network in the world. And they're in the midst of these things taking place there, but they're in every place you can imagine around the world, 3,650 of them. Pray for missionaries to be bold and have opportunities during this Christmas season to talk about Jesus. And then, my friends, you may have been to church before, maybe not. Maybe you came today because it is this Christmas season. Maybe you remember going to church with your grandmother or whatever. Whatever the reason is, the real question is, do you know this Savior personally? Jesus came to be your Savior, but you need to repent and believe in him. 
And if you're here today, don't lose this opportunity. Don't try to celebrate Christmas without Jesus himself living in your heart. What amazing opportunity we have. Because God came and made a way for us to come to him. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, at this time of year, we just thank you again. We're reminded of this amazing Savior and salvation that we don't deserve, but by your grace and love, you provided to us at great cost through Jesus Christ. Thank you that it got to so many of us, but if there's anybody here today who doesn't know you personally, God, I pray that your spirit would draw them, call them, pull them to you and that they would believe and be transformed forever. Lord, I lift up those nations that you've declared Jesus came to reach, and we were supposed to go and make disciples, but there's still so many who haven't heard. May they be like these people that I shared about this morning who just a few years ago had never heard anything about Jesus Christ, and now they wouldn't give up their faith in him for anything. May all the nations, and may we have a part in them hearing and believing in you. Draw us deeply into relationship with you during this season. Draw us to spend time in your word and in prayer and listening and singing and praising Because you are worthy. You are worthy of all the glory because all of this is because of you and not because of us. Thank you for that grace that we celebrate today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand. Amen. What an amazing word. Um, Isaiah 53, I just want to say this two verses again. Verse 4 and 5 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we continue, we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But we, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. I don't know where you stand this morning. I don't know if you're wounded or you feel like you're crushing and all those great things. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's where it all begins. Mm. As Dr. Din said, don't leave here not knowing. So if he was speaking to your heart, I want us all just to bow our heads and close our eyes. If he is speaking to you and you don't know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, I want you to silently pray this Mm. prayer with me and invite him into your heart. Simply admit, say, Lord, I'm broken, I'm wounded, I'm bruised. And I believe in that message that was preached just now. I believe that you sent your only son just for me. And this morning I make the choice and I will commit my life to following Jesus by faith. Come into my heart, Jesus. We thank you and I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If that was you, I want to be the first one to say congratulations. But after service, please go outside to the next step table so we can walk you through what you just went through with me. And for the rest of us, the reason for the season is not Christmas trees and gifts. It's actually Jesus Christ. So as you think through this holiday season, where do you stand with him and are you sharing the gospel? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that amazing word, Father God. May we be doers and not just hearers of your word, oh God. Change us from the inside out. As we begin to continue in service for tithes and offering, Father God, those who have something to give, we pray that they give it in the act of worship and love for you. Those who have nothing to give, may they give you their hearts, Father God. Bless those who are giving and bless those who want to give and have nothing to give. We thank you, Father God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.